This tutorial looks at the structure of the Earth, how we know a little about the layers of the Earth, tectonic plates and how they move, and a little about Wegener's theories behind this. You need to be able to understand and be able to name the crust, the mantle, the core and the lithosphere. The centre of the Earth is a hot core made mainly of iron. Um, on the surface of the Earth is a cold crust made of uh, hard brittle rocks. In between, however, is the mantle. The mantle is cold and rigid towards the surface but becomes hotter and more viscous or thick liquidy uh, nearer the core. The top surface of the Earth, which is the crust and the upper part of the mantle, is called the lithosphere. This is the cold, rigid outer part of the Earth. This lithosphere is made up of several large pieces, which are called tectonic plates. Um, they float on the surface of the mantle because they're less dense than the mantle. Our next part of the specification covers how we know about these different layers of the Earth. What we do know about the layers of the Earth certainly doesn't come from drilling down. The furthest we've been able to drill is around 12 kilometres, which is really just scratching the surface. The crust is just too thick to drill through. What we do know comes from earthquakes or other seismic activity. We know that when there is an earthquake, the earthquake sets off various waves, and these waves travel through the layers of the earth. However, although the P waves can travel through the core, the S waves can't and have to skirt it. Now, the length of time it takes for those S and P waves to be felt at various spots around the earth tells us a little bit about the layers of the Earth, because if we know the speed of these waves and we know how long it's taken them to get to various of these points, we can work out how far they've travelled and therefore where the layers of the Earth are. Look at the diagram. It shows the structure of the Earth. Label the diagram using words from the list. Well, the outermost would be the crust, the innermost would be the core, and between would be the mantle. Write down the name of the main metal present in the core. This would be iron. As you can see, an alternative answer to that last one is nickel. Next, we must know a little bit about the tectonic plates that make up the top surface or the uh, lithosphere of the Earth and how these can result in uh, volcanic activity and earthquakes when they move although we have to know that the movement of these is very, very slow. When we look at the layers of the Earth here, the core, the mantle, and at the top, the crust, uh, including the top layer of the mantle being the lithosphere, we can see that there are what are called convection currents within the mantle. This is because the very hot core here heats up the mantle above it, causing it to rise. As it rises towards the surface, it's got nowhere else to go, therefore it travels along the surface until it cools and sinks back down towards the core. These circular movements, or convection currents, are able to drag the tectonic plates either apart from each other, as in here, or here, towards each other. When they pulled apart from each other, this will allow magma to rise up through the surface as volcanoes and new crust is made. Where two plates are being pushed towards each other, they'll collide with each other and one is forced underneath the other. These movements, however, are very, very slow, only around 2.5 centimetres per year. It's taken around 200 million years for the continents to be in their current positions. Originally, scientists thought that there were wrinkles or mountains on the surface of the Earth because the Earth had cooled down and a little like an old apple or old orange had shrunk and uh, shriveled up. 
This, however, didn't explain why mountains weren't distributed over the entire surface of the Earth and were only in certain places. A man called Alfred Wegener put forward a theory about continental drift and how the continents had come to be in their current places. He said that the continents had once been joined together as one large supercontinent. He said that there was certain evidence to show this. One of the pieces of evidence was that the shapes of South America and Africa and various other continents around the world fit together as if they were once pieces of a jigsaw. Wigner also noticed that these continents had retained fossils of land animals. He said that these land animals had once roamed freely over this supercontinent, had died, and that their fossils had been buried into the old rocks. As these continents moved apart, the rocks moved with them. It's unlikely that the same land-based animal could have evolved separately in two continents, maybe three or four thousand miles apart. It's a more sensible option to say that these were once part of the same continent. There are what's known as glacial features. Those are um, features caused by glaciers, such as U-shaped valleys, in some odd places around the world, particularly in countries such as these around the equator. Now, the explanation that was given by Wegener was that these countries were once clustered together around one of the poles during the Ice Age. This meant that those features were laid down um, millions of years ago, but since then, those countries have now moved into their more warm current positions. Although Wegener put forward a lot of evidence about continental drift, and suggested that these continents had once been joined together, he couldn't say what forces had driven them apart. For this reason, other scientists at the time did not agree with his theories. Wegener's theory of continental drift is an example of how a theory comes to become accepted. It was only in the 1960s that other evidence was found which supported the idea of continental drift. Generally, theories are put forward because they explain a wide range of evidence and they're accepted when they've been discussed and tested by a wide range of scientists.